Hi, and welcome back. Today, I will show you how you can test and optimize a strategy on multiple assets and how you can aggregate the results and increase the total win rate and total returns. The reason this is an important approach in trading is that sometimes we are testing strategies with very selective indicators, and this usually leads to a very high win rate, which is excellent. However, these strategies suffer from a low number of trades, which means the automated system is idling and not trading the market for a long period of time. In other words, you get a lot of waiting time without any active trades on the market. The Python code I'll be using for the testing is available for free from the link in the description below so you can download it and rerun the tests we will go through in this video. In our strategy today we will use a trailing stop on the daily time frame so we can maximize profits from each trade. When we enter the market we will not define a take profit value but a dynamic stop loss distance that will chase the price in the winning direction until the market reverts back in the opposite direction which is where we will exit our position, taking advantage of the maximum range of the price movement. So also in the coding part, I will show you how we can code a trail stop in Python and optimize its parameters efficiently all along during the strategy backtest. In this video, we will use seven assets on daily time frame. Most of these are major Forex pairs, and I also included gold prices just for a small variation. You can extend the data to as many assets as you need. And to enter the market, I've chosen a very simple set of rules. First, we detect the trend using two moving averages. For example, to estimate the trend at this candle, we will consider a window of back candles, so a number of preceding candles, and we can check if within this window the fast moving average is always below or above the slow moving average. In this example, the fast moving average is below the slow moving average for all the back candles, so we detect a downtrend momentum. Another trend confirmation is also testing if the candles within the back candle window are all below or above the fast moving average. In this example, all the back candles are below the moving average, so we confirm the downtrend that was detected using the two moving averages. Typically, in a downtrend, we only allow shorting the market, and in an uptrend, we only allow long positions. Then we will use the Bollinger Bands to trigger entry positions. In a downtrend, we will wait for a candle to close above the upper Bollinger, because we expect the price to converge back to the center of the Bollingers. And moreover, in this example, we are in a downtrend, so this increases the likelihood of the price dropping down. In the opposite direction, if we have an uptrend, we wait for a candle to close below the lower Bollinger to open a long position. I also added one more condition on the spread between the upper and lower Bollinger values. An entry position is validated only if this Bollinger thickness is greater than a minimum threshold, because we want to avoid signals happening on very low volatility cases. Now we will code this strategy in Python and automate it for a full backtest on all the assets and the data present in the data folder. So this means the strategy will run on all the CSV files present in the data folder that we will be including in our backtest. This is our Jupyter Notebook file that you can download as mentioned from the link in the description of the video. So I'm going to go through these functions. First we have the read underscore CSV to data frame is going to read a file path and put it in a data frame. It returns a data frame. It does apply a bit of cleaning as well, removing the fractions of seconds and formatting and casting to date time the GMT time column. We also have another function called read data folder that's going to call the previous function read CSV to data frame. So it does open a folder and reads all the CSV files within the folder. It applies this function, the uh, read underscore CSV and then it returns the data frames and the file names. So the reason we need the file names for the data frames is to know which data frame is for which asset. In this folder, for example, I have the Australian US dollar, Euro US dollar, and so on. So we're going to get um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven data frames in return and seven file names in return in the same order as the data frames. Then we have a function called apply technical indicators. It takes a data frame and it will apply all the technical indicators needed for our strategy. It will return a new data frame that's simply modified or with added columns. Then we have a function called EMA signal. It takes a data frame, the uh, index of the current candle and the number of back candles to consider. And it's just going to compare the fast and slow moving average to see which one is above or below during the back candles window to return a trend signal. So a downtrend, return one, uptrend, return two, otherwise we have a zero. And this function is going to be used by the following function, which is update data frame with the EMA signal. 
it takes a data frame, it applies the EMA signal function, so previously defined, and it's going to add a new column called EMA signal to the data frame, and it will return the data frame at the end. Same thing for the total signal, we have our conditions here about the Bollinger Band and the width of the Bollinger Band, the threshold. Uh, we need to have an EMA signal, let's say, equal to 2, so that's a long or an uptrend. At the same time, a candle closing below the lower Bollinger Band curve and the width of uh, the Bollinger Band, so that's the uh, threshold or the width of the upper and the lower Bollinger Band. And at the same time, I just added one more condition. We need to have an RSI that's above 30 for the previous few candles or the previous back candles. And the reason is I needed to confirm the up momentum I didn't want to have uh, RSI values that are below 30, which means it's signaling something opposite than a bullish direction. If we have a bullish direction using the MA signal, and at the same time, the uh, closing price, the current candle is closing below the uh, lower Bollinger Band. If it closes too low, it's going to kill the momentum or the up momentum of, uh, of the asset. So it means that the uptrend might not continue. This is why I added an RSI uh, condition where all the back candles, actually, that we consider in the back candles window should have an RSI above a certain threshold, which is 30 here. And for the uh, bearish direction, it's simply the symmetrical cases, the symmetrical conditions of the bullish one. So all of this happens in the total signal function and the um, following function, add total signal to the data frame, is going to apply this function total signal to the current data frame or data frame passed as a parameter and it will be adding a new column to the data frame which is called total signal then we have a function called candles trend signal this is basically a function that's going to test if the uh, current candle and the previous back candles are all below or above the moving average so for this i use the uh, fast moving average you might want to decide to use the slow moving average there's no rule for this it's simply here you can just switch from fast to slow very easily and experiment what would be the effects on the final results so again if we have a bullish signal we return two if we have a bearish signal we return one in any other case we return zero and now we can update the total signal that's a new function that's going to uh, add this condition candles trend signal so whatever signal we have from the candles if they are above or below the uh, uh, moving average in this case we're going either to confirm the total signal that we got previously or we simply uh, reject it and this is just one more confirmation signal so we have lots of conditions i know but it's still simple we're still using simple indicators and i don't think it should be a problem for this strategy. Anyway, the new column DF total signal is now equal to total signal, whatever it was, in case the total signal confirms or agrees with the candle trend signal, so they are equal, and in any other case it's equal to zero. So that's it. These were our functions. I've defined these in the first cell. I'm going to run this cell and now we can use them. So we can, for example, use read data folder. I'm going to run this uh, it returns the data frames, the list of data frames and the names. So you can print the names here. We can see that it's reading all the files, the CSV files in the data folder. And you can also print actually the data frames themselves, but I don't think we will be getting any of the numbers for now. You can see that we have all the data frames as well. I'm going to revert this back to names because it makes more sense. It's more clear here to know what we've been loading. And now we just have to uh, apply these functions to all the data frames that we read from the uh, folder path dot data. This is where I put my data files. This is the folder data and these are the CSV files. And this is why I'm reading data frames and the file names from the uh, folder path dot slash data. And I'm using the read underscore data folder function that we've just defined. And for I and data frame, so basically we're looping over all the data frames here. We're going to apply technical indicators. We're going to update the data frame EMA signal. We're going to add total signal and we're going to update the total signal using the candles signal uh, here. So this is the function update total signal. It's going to use candles trend signal as well. So we're applying all the signals functions that we have previously defined. And at the end, we overwrite the data frame I 
So this is a list of the data frames, actually. We override the data frame with the updated version of the data frame with all the signals, columns, and all the technical indicators, computation, and so on. And this part might take some time because it's looping over all the data frames, but uh, I don't think it's going to take more than two to three minutes. And now just to make sure that we have signals, trading signals, I'm going to print the sum of the signals in all the data frames, because remember, we need to aggregate the results, aggregate the signals and so on. So we have 64 uh, bearish signal and 63 bullish signals. In other words, I mean, we transformed this from five to 10 signals up to 64 or 63 just by using the same strategy on multiple assets. If I would run this on one data frame or one currency, I don't think we're going to get more than 10 signals, but this can be verified by printing the signals from the different data frames. So I'm going to take this part, I'm going to print it here, and we can see how many uh, trades or how many signals we would have gotten per data frame. So here we have 12 bearish, only three bullish, 12 bullish, uh, one, 10 bearish, and so on. So you can see that now aggregating all of these signals is more efficient and it's going to yield more returns. Okay, now to the backtesting part, I'm using backtesting.py as usual and the signals, the column total signal, the uh, size of the trades is 10% of the equity and the current stop loss coefficient is equal to one. So this is going to be uh, the stop loss distance related coefficient. The stop loss distance is going to be related to the ATR, so the average true range. So whenever I'm trying to set a stop loss distance or a stop loss value, I will take the current open position of the trade, the uh, current closing price of the current candle, minus or plus this distance, the ATR times the stop loss coefficient. And this is what we're going to optimize. This stop loss coefficient value is going to be changed and we're going to repeat the back test for different values of stop loss coefficient. And we're going to come up with the best value in terms of returns. Now for the uh, trailing stop, actually it's done manually here in this for loop. So for all the trades, if the trade is long, I'm going to change its stop loss to the maximum between the uh, trade stop loss, the current stop loss, or minus infinity and the uh, close price minus the stop loss ATR. This way, for long positions, it's either the current stop loss if the price has moved back down, or if the distance is increasing between the stop loss and the closing price itself, we're going to set it to the closing price minus the stop loss uh, distance that we've just computed, and so on. So for the uh, short positions, it's the opposite. So that's going to be stop loss data dot close minus one. Th so the current closing price, the last candle's closing price plus the stop loss distance. And then if we have a signal equal to a bullish signal and we don't have any open trades on the market, we're going to apply a buy position and we pass the stop loss and the size of the, uh, the trade. Same thing for the bearish conditions. So if we have a bearish signal and so on, we pass a sell position. So that's the strategy, that's the class of the strategy. We're going to execute the cell. And now the part that we are going to repeat for all the data frames is the backtest part. So we're going to define the uh, backtest, but it's going to be for a new data frame. We're going to loop over all the data frames for DF in data frames. Our conditions here, I'm adding a small commission to account for the spread and some trading fees. Then I'm going to optimize the stop loss coefficient. So we're going to backtest each data frame many times for different stop loss coefficient values ranging from 0.8 to 3. So I'm running this. It's going to take some time as well because it's repeating the uh, optimization over all the data frames. The uh, results actually are appended in the results uh, list that we can see here. So these are the statistics for all the tests or the optimized tests for each data frame. And in this cell, I'm aggregating some of the results. So I need the uh, returns, for example, we're doing the sum of the returns uh, in percentage, the sum of the number of trades, we get the total number of trades. If we were trying to uh, trade all these assets at the same time with this same strategy. Also, I've accounted for the maximum drawdown. So that's the minimum because the drawdown is negative. We need to be cautious here. So we need to fetch for the minimum. And the average drawdown actually is also the uh, drawdown, the sum of the drawdowns for all the uh, data frames. 
uh, that we tested or back tested divided by the uh, number of the data frames. Then we have the win rate, the best trade, the worst trade, the average trade, the max trade duration, and the average trade duration as well. I'm printing all of these here. So just to show you how it works, this is what we're going to get. The aggregated returns are now 43%. The number of trades is 80. The maximum drawdown is minus 7.5%. And the average drawdown actually is minus 1.58%, the win rate 42%, and so on. So we have the best trade, the worst trade, and the uh, maximum trade duration, and the average trade duration. Remember that we're using the daily time frame, so it's not very weird that we're seeing few days or 80 days or 21 days. These numbers are uh, normal because we are working on a slow time frame. I've also added a part that's going to allow us to plot the equities for the different assets. So how did the strategy do uh, on the different assets, on different pairs and so on? This is where we can compare using this approach. Where did the strategy work best? And you can select these actually, these assets where the strategy worked best and maybe drop the other assets because they are not suitable for this current strategy. We can also print the total returns here and the names, for example, and you can see that 14%, which is good, it's for the Euro US dollar, 10% is for GBP US dollar, and 14% uh, here is for the gold US dollar. So this strategy, I think, is suitable for Euro US dollar, GBP US dollar, and the gold US dollar. Although it's showing some positive results for the other assets, but it's nothing very impressive. It's barely covering for the commissions and for the trading fees. Remember that we've included these in our simulation this time. So that's the uh, commission right here. I think it's working well for uh, these assets here, 14%, 10%, and 14%. The interesting part here would be that we could include, let's say, 50 different assets for three or four years, let's say. I'm starting in this data, I'm starting on the 6th of June 2017 up to 15th of June 2024. But in terms of assets, I think we can increase this to at least 30 assets, and then we can select at least 10 good assets where the strategy or this type of strategy works well. Now, the interesting part that you might want to apply is to change the conditions of the trading, change the strategy and test it on the different assets that you would like to trade to see where it works and where it fails. And that's all I had to tell you for this video. I hope you guys liked it. If so, please leave a like, leave a comment. If you have any ideas, please don't shy off from leaving a comment. I usually get a lot of ideas from our discussions in the comment section. Thank you for staying that long. Until our next one, trade safe and see you next time.